open up God's Word with you all. We're continuing our verse-by-verse study through Paul's letter to the Colossians. We see this in Colossians chapter 3, titled this message, The Seriousness of Sin. You know, as part of uh, preaching the Bible verse-by-verse, right, we'll come to topics, we come to to concepts that we don't often talk about, right? Things that we would rather maybe look at another day. But for this time, we are going to look at the topic of sin and how to put it to death. Now, let's see this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. In our text for today, God urges us to take our sin seriously. Here he gives us a strategy to fight against it, the ability to identify it, and the solution to avoid it. And simply, he tells us we must not play with the passions of our heart or entertain the lusts of our flesh. Instead, we must put them to death. This is of the utmost importance, a grave responsibility for every single believer. You must take your sin seriously. You know, this concept is it's uncommon in the modern church. It's really not heard of. Right? Just to, to be serious is anathema in the church. And to speak about sin is forbidden. Now, we're told it's not appealing. It's going to turn people away. We need to be more casual, relaxed, laid back. Take it easy. Focus on the positive. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find a church that preaches on hell and judgment and sin. So how do we end up here? The modern church says, don't talk about it. Yet the Apostle Paul says, put it to death. The world says, hey, let's leave it for another day. And God says, look at it in the face. I mean, this puts a preacher in a tough spot, doesn't it? What am I going to say? How did we end up here? Well, we, we, to understand that, we really have to look at our history, our history as a country. It all started with a movement in the late 1960s, early 1970s, called the Church Growth Movement. And the Church Growth Movement, a network of churches, consulting firms, marketing agencies, conferences, and publications got together, and they, they wanted to encourage churches in how to grow their numbers, how to be bigger. Not how to preach more clearly, not how to minister to the spiritual needs of the body, but how to grow numerically. That was the focus. Books like McGavern's Understanding Church Growth, Robert Schuler's Your Church Has Real Possibilities, and C. Peter Wagner's Your Church Can Grow helped American evangelicals to move towards a more pragmatic marketing strategy to build their church. It wasn't much about what God said in his word. It was now, what does, the, what does the consumer want? It was consumer-oriented. You know, when I worked in business, we had a, a sign on our desk, and it said, what does the customer want? That's true for every single profession except one. That's the job of a church. That's the job of a pastor. It's not what does the customer want. It's what does God want? The pastors adopted this. Robert Schuler, you guys know him from the Crystal Cathedral. Uh, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren. This was very popular, and it really led to what we now call the mega church. And some of these churches would go out; they'd go door to door, not door to door to preach and evangelize. They'd go door to door and say, "Why aren't you going to church?" They're trying to build a church for the unchurched. And the consensus was clear as they asked unbelievers why they weren't going to church. They told them, and they said, there's too much of focus on sin, and it's too serious. I'll go to church if you don't always preach on sin or ever preach on sin, and I'll go to church if it's more casual. From this, 
Men like Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, they devised devise a composite sketch of the, the person they wanted to bring in. Rick Warren called this person, the hypothetical person, Saddleback Sam. And his church was called Saddleback Church. And from Saddleback Sam, he wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And there he outlines how a church can be successful. And I just want to give you a, a couple points. This is how a church is successful according to the purpose driven model. He says a church must be seeker sensitive, aimed at drawing in the unsaved and the unchurched from the community. So instead of equipping the saints for the work of service, now the church's goal is to draw in unbelievers, a church for the unchurched. He says to do this successfully, here here are the parameters, the church must be non-threatening, familiar, comfortable, and casual. That will bring people in, right? I wear a business suit all day, all week. I don't want to do that on Sundays. Okay, we'll provide a church for you. But this didn't affect the service. It also affected the message. He said the message must only be positive. Don't talk about hell. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about judgment. Instead, you need to mix some sort of pop psychology, relevant cultural information, and uplifting scripture texts only. Deal with topics like guilt, self-esteem, interpersonal relationships, mood enhancement, motivation, encouragement. That will build your church. That's the model of the modern church. I mean, you can see it, right? How is a church successful? Be casual. Don't talk about sin. Be positive. And that's simply not biblical. And it's not loving. It's not biblical, it's not loving, because it's totally antithetical to God. There's no one who is more serious about sin than God. Because he knows the cost. He knows the consequences of sin. It's the death of his beloved son. God takes sin seriously because he knows the price That was paid on the cross at Calvary. And he knows that if we don't see our sin, we will never appreciate what Christ has done. Just consider the Psalms. God takes sin so seriously. These are are hard to read. Psalm 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Psalm eleven, five. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. The one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Psalm 45, 7. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Now, God takes sin seriously, and it's no different if we go to the life of Jesus, right? Jesus preached more about hell, more about the consequences of our sin than anyone. He called it a place of eternal torment, unquenchable fire. The worm does not die. There's no return. It's outer darkness. He called it Gehenna which was a trash heap outside of Jerusalem. God is serious. This is no joke for him, and that's why he puts it to his people. He wants them to see it for what it is. It's an offense against a holy God. And he wants us to know that his love is there behind it. When we see his sin, we see the cross of Christ. When we see sin, we see the solution that he provides for his people. And we see sin, we we know that God has a battle plan for it to fight against it. And this is the same exact attitude that Paul takes. It's the same attitude that, that Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and all the prophets have taken. Israel, the people of God, see your sin, call it for what it is, and know that God has given you the power to conquer it. Take it seriously, because God takes it seriously. It cost him the life of his only son. And we see this message in Colossians 3.5. This is Paul's attitude as well. We first see it in the strategy to combat sin. This is the first point. 
the strategy to combat sin. See the start in Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. This is powerful language. Therefore, it's really drawing all the evidence from the, the, the preceding verses. Right here, Paul is giving us an actionable plan. Paul, Paul's really answering the question, right? As you consider verses 1 through 4, you say, okay, Paul, here's my question. If I have really died with Christ and have been raised up with him, if I'm supposed to be seeking the things above and, and thinking on the things above, then what in the world am I supposed to do with my physical body? It keeps sinning all the time. And here Paul gives us a solution, right? He says there's work to do. He says consider it dead. Put it to death. This must be the aim of our Christian life. Simply, he's talking about killing sin. Killing sin because of what Christ has done. Now, Charles Spurgeon summarizes this whole point beautifully, powerfully. He says this, If Christ has died for me, ungodly as I am, without strength as I am, then I cannot live in sin any longer. I must arouse myself to love and serve him who has redeemed me. I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. It's a powerful statement. I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. I must be holy for his sake. Then he asks the question, how can I live in sin when he has died to save me from it? This is a command in the Greek. This is a second person. This is looking right at you. It's saying, hey, it's time to take responsibility. We see all that Christ has done, the triumph that we have in him, the place that he has set and prepared for us in heaven. And now Paul says, put it to death. It's necroo in the Greek. It's where we get our word necrosis. That's to shut off the blood supply. Shut off the blood supply to a part of the body. It, it shrivels up and dies. Paul is saying, you need to put your sinful self on notice. Right? No more food. You must shut yourselves off to evil and sinful desires. They must not captivate your thoughts or consume your time. He's saying this is necessary for your spiritual survival. You know, we often think of killing, right? We think of something quick, violent, action. But Paul's saying, no, 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 it all starts with the strategy, the plan. You have to shut off the food supply. You need a scorched earth policy. A plan that removes you from your sinful impulses, separates you from thoughts of the flesh, withdraws your time from worldly pursuits. This is so helpful. Right? Paul's not giving us some pseudoscience. He's not saying, be as you are and who you are, that's who you are. Thanks for nothing, Paul. No, he says, consider it dead. He wants to set us up for success. He says you need a biblical strategy to battle sin. And we see the, you know, those elite forces. We love to watch those movies of the, the army or the special forces of the Marines going in to, to take a beachhead or, or going in to rescue a hostage, right? We love the action. But what we don't realize is that five minutes of battle had countless hours of weeks and months of preparation strategy. That's what Paul's saying. Same for the Christian. We need a holistic strategy to put sin to death. It starts with a plan, the intentional decision to order your life to cut off the inroads that sin makes. That's so important. You know, I see this again and again, and it's, and it's heartbreaking. People will come with a struggle. They'll come with a sin, and they're ready to fight it. They're like, put them up, put them up, put them up. You're like the lion, you know? I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to fight. And they'll fight it. They have the will, but they don't have the way to take care of it. And ultimately, it consumes them. They fight, they fight, but they fall, and they're, they're, they're knocked out. You, know, you see it with countless problems. Your family will come, and they'll say, uh, struggling with, you fill in the blank. 
marriage, family, alcohol, pornography, job. This is in counseling, this is called a presentation problem. They bring the problem. Having trouble with my kids. I'm having trouble with my job. Can you fix it? What does the Bible say? I said, well, this is what the Bible says about your job, but let's talk about your life. And then they start to unravel their life. And you see that they have no biblical strategy for life. So sin, sin consumes them. They're not cutting off the supply that feeds sin. Right? Paul says, if you don't start with a change on this level, you will continue to fail. You might be brave. You might put up a good fight, but you're going to lose. You need to be strategic. And here he says, cut it out. Put it to death. You need a plan. But that's not it. I want to give you the full concept on what this means to put something to death. We find the other aspect of this, the action in Romans 8. So just go to Romans 8, and I'll spend a little time there. So you'll have a little time to get there, and I'm not going to flip to another scripture reference right away. So Romans chapter 8, verse 12. We're called to have a strategy, a battle plan. But we're also called to execute this plan, to put sin down once and for all. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body. This is the other angle. This is the action. This is a different word in the Greek. It's the nanto. The technical word is to cause a cessation of life. What does that mean? You put it down. You put it to death. This is an assassination. This is the plan is executed. You're cleared hot for action. This is aggressive. You see, Christians must be aggressive in putting sin to death. It should be this distinguishing mark of God's people. We don't trifle with sin because it killed our best friend. We understand Christianity is not some hypothetical game. I don't know if you've ever had that discussion with a Christian about sin, and it's, it's kind of hypothetical to them. Yeah, I sin, and you sin, and we all sin. It's not a game. It's not static. It's a war. It's a dynamic fight where it's easy to lose ground that you may never regain. you got to battle you got to be ready to have a plan and to execute that plan. This is just disappearing from the church. And whenever you see revivals in the church, you see a desire for sanctification, a desire to put sin to death. Here's a quote from John Owens. John Owens is a 17th century theologian, pastor, scholar. And when he speaks here, he's going to sound more like a, like a sergeant. He doesn't sound like your typical pastor. Just listen to this. What does he say? He says, do you mortify or do you put to death? Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work to be always at it while you live? Oh, cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. That's a powerful statement. The sins that we often entertain, the hatreds that we foster in our heart, the little pet peeves that we have, they are killing us. And they killed our best friend. Put them to death. But the church has lost its clarity of message. We, 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 we have given up the fight, and, and it's because, first and foremost, we can't even identify what a sin is anymore. Or just ask a pastor, is this a sin? He might say, well, it's wrong. It's a little crazy. I wouldn't recommend it. It's against my advice. Well, is it a sin, pastor? Well, I'm, I can't say. I don't want to be the one to judge. Well, my word, what does the Bible say about it? We're losing the fight. You confuse right from wrong, righteous from sinful. You know, if you ask any, any man that went through basic training or, or training in the, the armed forces, 
Before Iraq and Afghanistan, there was one person that they wanted to be mentored by, or one type of person, and it was a Vietnam vet. Because they had real battlefield experience. And we had a long period where we didn't fight any, any wars, and things started to become hypothetical. But they had real life experience. This is how you kill. As soon as we got to Iraq and Afghanistan, all these theories that they practiced after the Vietnam vets passed away, they started to realize that these theories weren't working because they weren't battle proven. It's the same for the church. It's the same for believers, right? We think we're fighting the fight in theory, but we're actually losing the battle. We need a battle proven strategy to put sin to death. And that starts with identifying the sin and that's our next point. We looked at the strategy. Now let's look at the sin. This is in the rest of Colossians 3.5. He says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Right? When we come to the sin, Paul does not stutter. He calls a sin a sin. He, he names it for what it is. He doesn't say things are wrong or, or ill-advised or insane. He says they are sinful. This allows him to identify the enemy and put him in his crosshairs. And in doing this, he focuses on three major categories of sin. If you don't struggle with one of these, then you are not breathing. This, is, this spans the gamut of the human experience. And here are the categories. It's sex, power, and money. Sex, power, money. When he talks about sex, it really is three words, immorality, impurity, and passion. That's all kind of in that category. Immorality speaks to sex outside of marriage, to fornication. This is a sin, an offense against God. But it's not just the act, right? We know from Matthew, from the words of Jesus, that even the thought is sin, in Matthew 5, 28, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This takes it right to the heart level. And for the time that this was written in Colossae, or immorality was normal. But as I'm researching this, there, there's a whole class of people that take care of this very natural need. There's a concubine, there's a female slave, there's the prostitute. There's even a category for the professional friend. The ancients called it natural, necessary, and as justifiable as eating and drinking. You know, people always say, is the scripture relevant? Of course it is. It's speaking to the world that we live in today, isn't it? Casual sexual encounters without any commitment, war every day. They threaten the sanctity of marriage, the picture that God desires the world to see from his people. And they threaten the fabric of society itself. What threatened the early church threatens the modern church. And some say, in fact, some say it's the most serious threat. The word for immorality is pornea. It's where we get our word pornography. And I just, one study on pornography, this is, it's shocking and it's saddening. But this is the state, not only of the culture, but the state of our church. This is a study from on and from Christians. This is a Barna group study in 2014. The statistics for Christian men between 18 and 30 years old are particularly striking. Just listen to these. 77% look at pornography at least monthly. 36% view pornography on a daily basis. 32% admit being addicted to pornography and another 12% think they might be. That's shocking. And it doesn't get any better as they get older, ages 31 to 49, 77% looked at pornography while at work in the past three months, 64% viewed pornography at least monthly, 18% admitted to being addicted to pornography, and another 8% think they may be. And it's even among married Christian men, 55% look at pornography monthly, 35% had an extramarital affair. I mean, it has consumed the church. I mean, pornography is really the height of the casual sexual encounter, but it doesn't stop there. 
And immorality doesn't exist in a vacuum. It leads to greater moral failure and degradation. And we see this in the next two words, impurity and passion. Impurity is vileness. You know, if immorality is the action, this is the state. It's the condition of one's soul who practices sex outside of marriage. It's really where that phrase, you know, living in sin comes from. This is a person who continues to violate the precepts of God's word. So that's the act and the state, and it leads to further corruption. You see that in the word passion. Immorality, impurity, passion. Passion's a strong desire. Here, sexual desires get twisted and placed on a new object. Right? Scripture calls this a degrading passion, and it manifests in what we see in our world right now. Right? Homosexuality, really gender anarchy. What is a woman? What is a man? You know, I have friends, you know, they're not believers, they're conservatives, and they'll say, well, I can't believe what's going on in the culture with gender. And I say, well, you're living with your girlfriend. Do you know that contributed to this? You know, the thoughts that I have, they contribute to this. That's the world that we live in. That's the world that Paul says we have the power to put to death to separate, to show ourselves different from this world, to give them a light, a pathway out of this insanity. I mean, this is the natural progression. So first Paul calls out sexual sin. Then he goes to the next category of sin. This is power or or violence, you could call it. Really what this is, is is this. It's, I want what I want, and I want it now. And you see this in that word, evil desire. I want what I want, and I want it now. It's a pursuit of something forbidden, an unsatisfied case of I want these, and the determination to do whatever I can to get it. I'll deceive, I'll manipulate, I'll twist, I'll demean, I'll threaten, I'll resort to violence if necessary. This is the endless pursuit to satisfy one's desires. It can manifest in anything. Now, I hate to give a list because you say, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not gambling. I'm not drunk. I'm not a glutton. Well, it manifests in everything. Whatever desire is compelling you to sin, that's the problem. You're seeking power. I want to get mine. I want it, and I will have it despite the cost. The term can mean to well up, to boil up, to go up and smoke. This is an impulse that counts nothing and no one in the equation, and it has one goal, satisfaction, self-satisfaction. And you see this in James chapter 4. You can go there if you like. James chapter 4, he talks about, this. uses this very word. Is what is the source of quarrels? In James chapter 4, verse 1, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you is not the source your pleasures or your desires that wage war in your members. I want, I want, I want. And then he says the result of that, verse 2, you lust and do not have, so you commit murder. Right? In this murder, you know, you think, well, I haven't killed anybody, right? That's not what he's talking about, right? It can be in deed, it can be in word, it can be in thought. Again, going back to Matthew, Matthew 5, you know, you call your brother an idiot, you've murdered him in your heart. And all this comes down to expectations. I want it, and I expect you to give it to me. And this answers another question in our culture. You say, why are things like they are with the whole gender revolution? And I asked the question, why is there so much violence in our culture? You know, somebody was just shot down in California the other day. Why? Well, it's because of this evil desire. Everyone has an unwritten, unknown expectation. And when they don't get it, they get angry. And there's retribution. That's what Paul speaks to. Now, maybe you're, maybe you're a super Christian, right? And you say, well... I've got a biblical explanation for my anger, right? This is righteous anger. So just a quick pastoral aside here. If that's you, ask yourself two questions. Is it really biblical? And the second question is, who is the judge? 
Right? If you have a legitimate biblical expectation and it makes you angry day after day after day, it means that you're judging the person in your heart. God's the judge. Let him take care of it. Paul's calling out all the sins. And remember, this is written to the church, to the, the, the dear believers, the people he loves. He wants them to know Christ and grow in Christ's likeness. He's saying be careful of sex, be careful of power, violence, and finally money. Another section of the scripture calls this the root of all evil. You see this in the word greed. This is the state of desiring to have more than one's due. Somebody who has to have everything, right? Their hands are in every pot. Mine, 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 right? These, these people are exhausting demons. They tire everybody out. Paul's saying they're insatiable. They're covetousness. They're, they're, they're coveting. This word for greed in the Greek is it's two words, actually. It's a compound word. It's pleon, which is more, and exe, which is to have. This is someone who's having more. They always want to have more. It's never enough. Never satisfied, never content. It's not just material hunger. It's for anything, for fame, success, recognition, whatever it is. Here's just a couple additional definitions from my study. Let's help us give a picture of this word greed. It's to take the greater whole. To take the greater whole. I remember going over to a friend's house, my best friend's house. He had a big cookie, and he said, why don't you cut it in half? It was a trick. I cut it in half, right? The bigger half for myself, of course. And I went to go grab the bigger half, and he said, well, the person who cuts never chooses in my house. And I thought, oh, that is such a good rule, you know? So next time I'm really trying to, like, slice that cookie just perfectly, you know? That's in our hearts, isn't it? We always want a little bit more. Can I get a little bit better price? Can this vacation be a little bit better? Can my husband be a little bit nicer, right? We're always seeking more, more, more. We're never content with what we have. It's to take advantage of. It's to seek political gain. It's the will to press to one's advantage. In short, it's self-love and selfishness. And, and it's really demeaning. That we're now treating as someone as beneath us. And we're saying, I deserve better. Why? Well, it's me, right? God's saying, no, 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 that's not how you should think. That's greedy. One philosopher said this, the greatest evil for man, himself. Charles Spurgeon, this is a quote in my office, beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. Isn't that true? Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our own worst enemies within us. If we fail to identify sin, then we can never eliminate it from our lives. If we don't have a strategy and a plan to cut off its supply, we will be overcome by it. It's like drinking from a water hose and, and trying to close our mouths. Turn off the water first. The result is we will not be devoted to God but ourselves. And Paul makes this so clear in the last section of this verse. He says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry, false worship. We might not be the father who sets the fire or the mother that, that makes the dough or the children that collect the sticks to, to, to make a bread for the mother of heaven. But we create idols in our heart every single day from these three categories, from sex, from power, from greed. And if the sin is unidentified, if it's unaddressed, if it's unhindered, it will lead to self-worship and self-centered living. And it causes us to harden our hearts toward God and other people. It's heartbreaking. We looked at the strategy that Paul gives us. We looked at the sin, and now let's look at the solution. What's the solution to this problem? You know, how, how do we escape what seems to be the inevitable? This is so gracious of Paul, right? And it's interesting. 
Because what does he say? Verse 6. For it is because of these things, because of sins, that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Whoa, 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 Paul. That's not the gospel. Right? We're waiting for Jesus loves you, come as you are, right? For every sinner, there's a place in heaven. That's not the angle that Paul goes. He's given us the full gospel. He's saying, remember these sins, someone's going to have to pay for them. If you're a believer and you've placed your trust in Christ and you love him and serve him and have a life of obedience, then Christ will bear your sins. But if you walk in sin and you're a son of disobedience, God's wrath is headed for you. He says, hey, you have a problem? I can't put my sin to death, Paul. Come on. It's too hard. Well, he's saying, here's the other option. God's complete and perfect righteous justice for all the sin of mankind. Apart from the heavenly glories that Paul talks about in the opening verses of Colossians 3, this is the greatest motivating factor for a believer, judgment. God's solution to the problem of sin and man's failure to identify it and put it to death, and it's his wrath. See that word, because of these things, God's wrath will come. This is outright censored in most churches, right? But it's paramount for Paul. He takes sin seriously. I just want to look at this word wrath. It's so important for us to understand. We hear that word wrath, and what do we think? Getting angry, right? Flying off the handle. But rather, this word refers to the righteous justice of God, his strong indignation directed at wrongdoing. Romans 2.5 says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God's of God. God's wrath is poured out according to his righteous judgment. And it's poured out on the sons of disobedience. These are the people who have decided to go against God's word time and time again. And what Paul is doing here, he's making an important point. He's saying, if you continue in your sin, despite the fact that you call yourself a Christian, this might be you, a son of disobedience. He's asking, how long will you continue to reject the clear commands of God to abandon a godly strategy, to not identify sin, yet still claim allegiance to him? This is a powerful, powerful section of the scripture. And Paul could continue to press it home, but he doesn't. Instead, he turns to the other part of the gospel, right? He he looks at God's wrath, the inevitable justice of God over the sins of man, and then he turns to God's mercy. He could crush us here, but he doesn't. Look at this in verse 7, really verse 6. Look, he says, For because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, but then he stops and he says this, And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. He says, that's who you used to be. Now you're different. You are no longer identified as a son of disobedience. Now you are a slave of Christ. You're no longer captive to the sins of this world. You are now set free and given the power to put them to death. That's the gospel. God's wrath and God's mercy and grace in his son, Jesus Christ. And one writer writes this about the gospel and God's wrath. He says, the gospel gives me boldness first by banishing my greatest fear, the fear of God's eternal wrath. Indeed, Christ bore God's wrath upon himself, not simply so I could escape the wrath on some future day, but also that I might be released from the daily fear of such wrath as I think ahead to judgment day. Because this fear hinders the ongoing work of God in me, the love of God continually expels this fear whenever it appears 
and nurtures within me a confident eagerness to face God on judgment day. Living in the daily relief of this frees me up to continue being perfected in confidence by the love of God, and it also serves to put all other fears into perspective. That's the gospel. It's not sin, 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 sinner. It's not God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. No, it's God's wrath is coming over the sin of men, and Jesus is the solution. His immense love covers you and forgives you. If we take sin seriously, we can share in a strategy to put sin to death. That really works. We can identify sin and call it what it really is, and we can see that the solution is in Jesus Christ and his unending forgiveness. That's an incredibly powerful picture, and it's something that the world cannot offer. I used to go back to those mega churches just for a moment as we conclude. Now, Bill Hybels, a New Village church, they were growing. They were in a time of incredible expanse. Tens of thousands of people were identified with the church, and they put out a survey to the church. The church is successful by all means. They, they put out a survey and they really ask everybody, how are you doing? And people say, I have no relationship with God. I don't feel connected with him. And my sin is consuming me. They were doing all the programs. Right? They were involved. They looked apart, dressed the part, talked apart. But they had no enduring relationship with God. Because sin wasn't addressed. And they weren't given the tools to combat it. As the survey returned, the leadership said it was shocking, it was unnerving, but it didn't change. In fact, this just shows the scope and scale of this. Their pastor, Bill Hybels, the man who set all of this up and devoted it all, 2018, multiple charges of sexual allegations, he retires. If we don't take sin seriously, then we will have a problem that will consume us. If we do, we have a solution, and it's in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you and the word that you give us. Help us to understand that our sin is forgiven in Jesus, that we are no longer captive to it. Help us to know that we are still called to identify it and put it to death day after day after day. And we can only do this in and through the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, may these words be an encouragement as we think about who we once were and now who we are in your Son, as we know that there is a clear strategy, a plan to put it to death, to cut off the supply of sin and to put it down once and for all. God, help us to fight this battle day after day and not lose ground. Help us to encourage each other, not condemn but to lift each other up as we walk in greater faithfulness, purity, and trust in you, in your word, and in your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand as you're able and join together as we sing.